You are seen, you are known, and you are loved. And that's not just something you just see at Hobby Lobby on one of those nice signs or on one of the t-shirts around the conference. That is a deep truth. You are seen, you are known, you are loved. And Jesus comes to meet us in all the times and in all the places. He goes before us and he waits for us. I want to open up scripture with you tonight to John chapter 4, to a passage that's very dear to my heart. It's a passage that I prayed with a lot of times. It's a passage that Jesus is always doing something new every time I break it open. And it's his, Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well. One of my favorite things in the liturgical year is, for those of you who maybe came into the church through the uh, RCIA process, the scrutinies as part of the period of purification and enlightenment, the very first scrutiny, we hear this gospel on the third Sunday of Lent. Because it's preparation for baptism. So it talks about water, so baptism, we got to do that, right? But that's not why the church chooses it. The church chooses it because it's all about encounter. And so we hear in John's gospel, Jesus left Judea and departed again to Galilee. He had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and so Jesus, wearied as he was with his journey, sat down beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. Jesus had to pass through Samaria. I checked out a map. I, don't, I didn't take a picture of the map, but it was kind of interesting because, yes, to go from Judea to Galilee, Samaria is right in the middle, but Samaria was a place that Jews probably wouldn't hang out. And so the traditional route for a Jew to go from Judea to Samaria was actually to go around Samaria. But scripture tells us Jesus had to pass through Samaria. Why did he have to do something that was so different than what everybody else did? Well, because he's Jesus. But that had to pass through Samaria is the urgency of the heart of Jesus. It's the urgency of his heart for the woman that he knew that he would encounter at the well. And as we continue on reading in that gospel, what we find is that Jesus actually gets to the well first. He races to the well in a sense, so that he can be there in the heat of the day when this woman who he sees, who he knows, who he loves, will come to draw her water. And think about it. We know from reputation that this woman, if she's coming in the heat of the day, it's because she had a reputation. But she's going to be kind of uncomfortable going there in the heat of the day. I mean, we were outside in the heat of the day today. It was hot. Lots of layers here. It was very hot. But Jesus is willing to put himself in the uncomfortable place. He's willing to go to the uncomfortable place first in order to receive this woman. And the gospel continues. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Isn't it interesting that this woman comes to draw water and Jesus is like, no, I want a I wanna drink. His thirst is going to come first every single time. Do you ever have one of those days where you're like, I feel like going to pray right now. You're like, I'm feeling really good. I'm going to go pray right now. Guess what? That wasn't your idea. <laughs> that was actually his idea. He thirsts for us that we may thirst for him. This is from the catechism, paragraph 2560. I would say, it's my favorite paragraph in the catechism. And then I read another paragraph. I'm like, that's my favorite paragraph in the catechism. But this is really one of my favorite paragraphs in the catechism. God thirsts for us that we might thirst for him. He waits there beside the well. His thirst comes first every single time. Jesus, the woman said to Jesus, How is it that you, a Jew, ask of me this drink? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. This living water. Jesus has this great gift to offer us in a living water, a water that's not just going to quench our earthly thirst, but it's going to go a whole lot deeper. And he begins this little thing about living water by saying, if you knew the gift of God, do we know the gift that we have and the reality that he is a refuge, that he is a strong refuge, that he is a place for us to find rest? Because when this woman comes to the well, she's actually looking for a refuge and she doesn't even know it. And she encounters a refuge and she doesn't even know it. And it's through their conversation that she comes to discover what a refuge is there. 
And this little, this little quip by Jesus, if you only knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked first. My friends, so often we're thirsty and so often we need a drink and we're not willing to ask. Jesus desires to know what we desire. He desires that we would share with him our thoughts and our feelings and our desires. In the same way that he waited at the well, seeing and knowing and loving this woman, offering himself to her first as a drink, as a refreshing living water, he sees us, he knows us, he loves us, he waits for us at the well so that he can also be a refreshing living water to us. There's three words that kind of uh, express what Jesus is doing here for this woman. She, he's very present to her. He's not looking for someone else. He's not off with his disciples who went into town to buy food. He's there with her. That living presence. And it's hot. He's willing to sit out there in the discomfort of the day, offering his sacrifice. And he does all of this for the sake of communion that he might be in relationship with this woman, that he might invite this woman out of the false refugee, refuges that she's been seeking for most of her life into the safe and true refuge of his heart. This woman comes in the middle of the day in order to hide. And what she discovers is she actually can't be hidden in his presence. There is no way to hide in his presence except for to be hidden in his presence to climb inside that space that he's created for us in his heart. What she discovers as this conversation goes on that Jesus draws out of her through a lot of questions. He asks lots of questions of this woman. And whenever Jesus asks questions, it's wise for us to pay attention. I spoke with the women about this earlier today. When Jesus asks a question in scripture, it's an invitation for us to answer in the here and now. Because those questions weren't just given for the people back then. They were given for us here and now to enter into relationship. That's how you build a relationship, right? You ask questions. What's your name? Where are you from? What's your favorite color? Orange, in case you were wondering, right? There's a sense of I ask a question and I receive the truth of someone else's revelation. And then I ask another question, maybe a little bit deeper, and I receive the truth of someone else's revelation. And Jesus asks questions of this woman so that he can receive from her the deeper truth of the revelation, that which she pours out. And as he continues to ask questions, it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And he's poking and he's poking and he's poking, not drilling. He's just being gently invasive in her heart in such a way that as he goes deeper and deeper and deeper, something new starts to happen there. Something new starts to bubble up. Jesus meets this woman precisely where she is, but he has no intention of leaving her there. He has no intention of leaving her there at the well. I don't know if you know the song, Jesus, What a Savior, but it's, it's one of my favorites, and it's one, as I was preparing this talk, that just kind of kind of came to my heart, and just goes, um, Jesus, what a Savior, what a brother, what a friend, lifter of the lowly, God, you meet me where I am. Your heart, it knows no borders, knows no walls. You're constantly moving towards me with open arms. I've never known a love like yours. I've never known a love like yours. This woman never knew a love like Jesus' love. This heart that was moving towards her, that was saying, hey, I've got a refuge for you. You can hide here. You don't have to worry about trying to hide in all these places you've been hiding. You don't have to worry about trying to protect yourself in all the places you've been protecting yourself. But you can come right in here because I made a space for you. A couple of years ago, um, I had an opportunity to go on retreat. I have an opportunity every year to go on retreat for a week of silence. If you can imagine me being quiet for a week, it happens every year. And um, one of the things that's really kind of come alive in me the past several years is um, painting my prayer. And I'm not an artist. I've never taken art lessons or anything like that. And it started out just kind of like just picking up some paints and making backgrounds like on canvases. And then I would write a quote with Sharpie because it's easy and you can control Sharpie a little bit better. 
And uh, this particular year, it was 2017, about six years ago, as I started my retreat at the beginning, uh, at the end of July, kind of beginning of August, there was just a lot that was very heavy on my heart. I was angry a lot about a lot of things. My grandfather was dying, and he actually ended up dying in the course of this retreat. Uh, and there was just a lot, of, a lot of pain, a lot of sadness, a lot of anger, a lot of things. And this image is kind of what my heart felt like. It felt stony and cracked. It felt chained, locked, and icy. If you ever have a chance to go to uh, the Cathedral Basilica in St. Louis, the way that hell is depicted is not flames, it's actually ice. And as the souls are going down into hell, it gets colder and colder and icier and icier. And that's what I felt like was happening in my heart. Like kind of this coat of ice over the top of it, pretty locked up. And so I had, I had painted this image and was just kind of praying with it and offering it to Jesus. And you kind of see there's a stone wall being built in front of the heart to protect myself. And about halfway through the retreat, the retreat master pulled out that classic quote from C.S. Lewis about to love at all is to be vulnerable. Like if you, if you don't want to be vulnerable, that's fine. Just keep your heart locked up. Don't love anyone, not even an animal, that one. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I think that quote was for me because <laughs> that's exactly what I painted like two days ago. And so as I began to bring that to Jesus and to ask him to unlock, to set free, to soften, to melt, and to break down the walls, a lot of different things started to happen. I started to find my security, not in the security that I've created for myself. I started to find refuge, not in the refuge that I was building for myself or that I had built for myself. But as I began to allow Jesus into those places and spaces, something new began to happen. He revealed to me that he wasn't going anywhere, that he was gonna be right there and he was gonna be slow and he was gonna be patient and he was gonna give me permission to allow him into those spaces and places in the same way that with the woman at the well, he was slow and he was patient and he just asked questions and gave her permission to be herself and to be in her stuff. And he didn't run away from it. And so what I ended up doing as, as retreat went on, I actually, I have the actual canvas right here for you. Uh, and it's one of those cheap canvases that comes like 10 for a dollar in a pack, you know, so it's not super fancy or anything like that. Uh, and on the back, you're supposed to write your name and your date when you give it as a gift, but this wasn't really for anybody else other than me. And so I just went ahead and painted on the back what he began to do. And you can start to see that what he did was he allowed new and living water to burst forth in my heart. And that as a new and living water burst forth in my heart, a water that I wasn't getting for myself or procuring for myself. It was the water and the force of the water moving in me and through me that the chains were broken, that the wall started to melt down, and that new life started to burst forth in the form of orange flowers, because orange is my favorite color. This is the new life right here. This is the new life. This is the new and living water that comes when we place ourselves in Christ's presence when we receive the grace that comes from his sacrifice, and we, when we allow him to enter into a deeper communion with us, when we allow ourselves to, to put down the walls so he can come and meet us in the places of the deepest pain, the deepest fear, the deepest shame, the deepest sin, that's exactly where he wants to be with us. Again, I spoke earlier with the women that the key preposition of the spiritual life is with. This is what he demonstrates at the side of the well. He just wants to be with the woman. And as he's with her, new things begin to happen to the point where then she's sent out on mission. She's sent to go proclaim the goodness of who Jesus is. She's sent to go say, come and see this man who told me everything that I did. I don't know that I would want to invite someone to come see him, meet the man who I told everything I did, right? Like, but Jesus knows it. And he wants, she wants other people to experience that same kind of freedom. The freedom that can only come from being in his presence. The freedom that can only come from receiving the gift of his sacrifice. The freedom that comes from true and honest communion. Jesus desires to be our safest refuge. Bob last night said that refugees rely on the kindness of others. And this is precisely what this woman recognizes, receives. She receives the kindness of Jesus' heart. In some translations of scripture, the word kindness and mercy are interchangeable. It's kind of interesting. Only goodness and kindness shall follow me all the days of my life in Psalm 23. Some translations, only goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Jesus is so, so kind and so, so merciful. And he wants us to be refugees in his heart. 
He wants us to live at, with his heart as our true refuge. Because the, the world offers us plenty of refuges, quote unquote refuges. Come and be here. This is a refuge. This is a place where you can be safe. This is a place where you can be seen. This is a place where you can be known. This is a place where you can be loved. My friends, those are counterfeits and they're not gonna last. And they might look real shiny on the outside, but I'm gonna tell you right now, they're not refuges at all. They're actually traps. Because you're going to get in there thinking that you're going to be seen, thinking you're going to be known, thinking you're going to be loved, and it's only a trap because it's going to run out. And the shiny luster is going to wear off and it's going to be dark. And the living water you think you're going to receive is going to dry up and you're going to be thirsty. Jesus' heart is the only sure and true refuge that will not leave us thirsty and that will not leave us alone in the dark. Because in his heart... We receive his, his gaze. We're able to enter into that presence, live in the sacrifice, and experience deep, deep communion and fulfillment that comes in no other place. A security, a meaning, a wholeness, a true and lasting love. And Jesus just doesn't want to be some refuge among the other refuges. Like, I do the Jesus thing on Sunday and maybe on Wednesday night at Bible study, but then all the other days I have my other refuges. I have this group of friends and that's kind of a refuge for me. It's safe. I feel seen. I feel known. I feel loved there. Friends are great. Friendship is beautiful. But even that doesn't always last. And sometimes the people we think are friends are actually not our friends. I hate to break it to you if no one's told you that yet. Jesus is the only sure and lasting refuge. And he's the only one that we can truly trust and rely upon to be that safe relationship is what leads us into that place of refuge, right? Again, some of those false refuges are places that we might go to find rest, but they're actually just places that leave us restless. And in our scripture passage for this weekend, we've been praying with Matthew eleven twenty-eight: 28, that come to me, all you who labor and find life burdensome, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, I had some, where are my people who live in rural areas? I know there's lots of you here this weekend. Yeah, <laughs> rural life, woo! I'm a total city girl and I know nothing about rural life, um, so I had to do a little bit of research, but I do know this much because I've seen it in a stained glass window before, but this is what a yoke looks like for you city kids like me, cool. So a yoke is a, is a farm implement that was used, right? You place the, uh, the beast, the two equally yoked beasts of burden about the same size, about the same ability in the, in the yoke, and they're able to plow the fields. Um, now we use John Deere or Case if you're red tractor people. Uh, but the yoke is this farm implement that's used, and if there's only one animal in it, it's going to be kind of lopsided. The job is not going to get done, and it's going to be really burdensome for the one animal. But when there's two animals in there, it's going to be much more efficient, it's going to be equal, and they're probably going to be able to do things a lot more freely. When Jesus invites us to get in the yoke with him, or rather when he invites us to let him in the yoke with us, that's where the rest is going to come. We don't have to do it ourselves. We don't have to carry it ourselves. The woman that Jesus meets at the well has been carrying it herself the, her entire life. And she's tried to find other people to help her carry the burden. And every single time it's failed. She's had five husbands. And the woman she's, the man she's living with then is not her husband. Lots of people she's reaching out to to help carry the burden. But the reality is, Jesus is like, I want to carry the burden with you and for you. Any false refuges that we go to to find rest are just going to leave us restless. And instead of presence, we're going to find isolation and absence Instead of sacrifice, it's probably going to look a lot more like selfishness. And instead of communion, it's just going to be that isolation. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to live in a space of absence and selfishness and isolation. I want to live in that space of presence, sacrifice, and communion. That's the place we want to live, friends. That is exactly where we want to live. In that place, in the heart of Jesus. That heart is most fully revealed to us on the cross as Jesus stretches out his arms between heaven and earth, surrendering himself to the Father in the truest and surest act of sacrifice, in the most perfect act of sacrifice, in the most perfect act of abandonment 
to the Father's hands. He gives himself over to the Father. On that side of the, the slide, you see this image of Diego Velasquez's crucifixion. If you're from the Diocese of Peoria, it's in your cathedral. If you're from St. Louis, it's in your old cathedral. And it's my favorite image of the crucifixion because it's just Jesus. When I taught high school, I, I held this image up in my classroom and I said, does this look like loneliness to you? Because Jesus is all alone there. It's not even one of those images that has Mary and John and Mary Magdalene at the foot of the cross. Jesus is all alone there, but does it look like loneliness? And pretty unanimously, my students were like, somehow no. So what makes that not loneliness? Jesus is with his father. And the picture on the other side is an image of what's called the smiling Christ. And that's a, a crucifix that's in the castle in Javier, Spain, where St. Francis is a chapel in the castle where St. Francis Xavier, the great Jesuit missionary, was raised. And what do you notice about Jesus? He's kind of got this little smirk on his face. He's dying with a smirk on his face. Why? Because he knows, A, that he's not alone, and B, that he wins, and C, that in this very act, he's making a space for us to enter into his life, to enter into his love. And after the resurrection, as he opens his side, as his side is opened on the cross, those wounds are maintained. And after the resurrection, it's that wound that St. Thomas is able to place his finger in. Now, you can't get a real close look at this slide, but I, I encourage you to look up this image. It's Caravaggio's The Incredulity of St. Thomas, the Doubting Thomas, right? My favorite thing that I noticed about this image, and I've looked at it for years, is that Thomas's fingernails are dirty. Kind of a weird detail. And if there's any medical people in the room, you're like, get the Neosporin, right? Like, that's bad news. But Jesus allows Thomas, and not just allows, but if you notice, he's actually taking Thomas's hand and directing his hand into the wound. He's like, get in here, Thomas. I want you to reach in and to touch my heart. I want you to touch my heart that beats for you. I want you to touch my heart that bled for you. And I want you to recognize you have a place here. You have a place in my heart. That this is a, a place that's been made for you, created for you, to live in my presence, to live in my sacrifice, to live in my communion. There's a beautiful prayer, it's kind of part of the tradition of the church, called the Anima Christi, Soul of Christ. Fun fact, if you ever want to know where we get the names of prayers and encyclicals, it's actually just the first two words in Latin. It's not super fancy. So the first two words of the prayer are Soul of Christ, so Anima Christi. But as you go through the prayer, uh, there's a line that says, within your wounds, hide me. Within your wounds, hide me. And this, this beautiful kind of invocation that we ask Jesus, Jesus, I want to hide in your wounds. Right around the same time that I painted that really dark heart with the chains around it, <laughs> I was praying that prayer. And after I prayed that line, Jesus, within your wounds, hide me, there was kind of this little tug at my heart and this sense of Jesus saying to me, no, 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 no. Within your wounds, hide me. I want, I want to get inside of all the places of your heart that are lonely, that are isolated. I want to get inside there. And I want you, Sister Carolyn, to hide me inside of all those places and spaces that have need and that cry out and that are thirsty and that are dark. Because I want to bring my presence into your heart so that you might know the power of my sacrifice, so that you might live in communion with me. And as the wounds of Jesus are glorified in his resurrected body, we celebrate that every year at the Easter Vigil. And right before the kind of the first part of the Easter Vigil, there's a blessing of the candle. And the priest, as he blesses the candle and he carves a cross into it and places these little sticks of incense into it to represent the wounds of Jesus, this is the prayer that he prays. By his holy and glorious wounds, may Christ our Lord guard us and protect us. By his wounds, his holy and glorious wounds, may Christ our Lord guard us and protect us. The wounds of Jesus are the safest place that we can be. There is nothing else that will guard us and protect us in the same way as the wounds of Jesus. This is the place that we're invited to be refugees, 
to get inside, and as refugees set up a new place to build a life, and they find new shelter and new security and new safety, this is the place where we are to find a new shelter, new security, new safety. In the very beautiful, glorious, and holy wounds of Jesus, the place where we can be seen, the place where we can be known, the place where we can be loved, the place where we can experience his presence, where we can literally be inside of his sacrifice so as to know the deepest place of communion. So as we enter into a time of prayer this evening, as Jesus himself comes among us, as we gaze upon him, Jesus exposed in the blessed sacrament, right? Not hiding in the tabernacle, he's exposed. When you're exposed, you're really vulnerable. And he's making himself vulnerable for us. He's making himself woundable for us. He's showing forth his wounded and bleeding heart for us. And our prayer is, Jesus, move your vulnerability into my life. Move your vulnerability into my heart. Make my heart woundable by your love. Jesus, wound me with your love. And as Jesus moves about tonight to just recognize what are the things in my life that prevent me from entering in more deeply to relationship? What keeps me from entering into his presence? What keeps me from his gaze? What keeps me from letting him touch everything that needs to be touched? What holds me back from responding to the great gift that Jesus wants to give? As he spoke to the woman at the well and said to her, if you only knew the gift of God, he says that to us tonight. If you only knew the gift that I want to give you tonight, let's open our hearts to receive all that he is, all that he has, his true presence, the sacrifice of his love, and true and lasting communion.